So in Genesis chapter 3, we find that Adam and Eve messed up. And we, we like to sometimes use words like messed up or made a mistake and, and things like that. But honestly, what did they do? They sinned. And sometimes for ourselves, and it's, it's, it's very much, it's a lot easier to say that about Adam and Eve than it is about ourselves. But we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We're not looking at any circumstances. We're not looking at, at any people and saying, you did this, they did that, and, and, and looking with, with the eyes of those who don't understand because we sin. And so when we, when we look at these passages, and we see that, that within chapter 3, I mean, there's, there's already been given instruction by God, Adam, and we know that he passed that instruction along to Eve. But she repeats it to the serpent in the first part of chapter 3, but they both end up eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And in doing so, we see punishments that come. We see uh, consequences that result from their sin. I mean, they're, they're, they're cast out from the garden. We see that, that, there is, that there is pain that comes to the woman. We see that the, the man, uh, the ground is cursed because of what he has done. And, and thorns and thistles spring up. He has to work now where he wasn't having to work before. I mean, just taking care of the garden, um, but not in the way that now he's having to work. And it says in verse 19, By the sweat of your brow you will eat food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. And so we see all of this taking place and them put forth out of the Garden of Eden, this, this perfect paradise that God has created for them. And we see life going on. We see Cain and Abel come on the scene in chapter 4. And it's, it's kind of like a, here we go again. Cain and Abel come on the scene and Abel seems to be doing pretty good, and we, we just have to assume, um, because God is fair, God is just, that God has given some instruction to him about how they, how they are to sacrifice to him or to offer to him. And, and so he accepts Abel's sacrifice, which is the first fruit from his flock, but he doesn't accept Cain's sacrifice. He doesn't look on it favorably. And so Cain's really upset. It's almost comical because it says it shows on his face. <laughs> he has a he has a sour face because God didn't didn't accept his sacrifice or his offering. And when they're in the field, he rises up and he kills his brother. And then it just kind of goes from there. As you begin Again, looking through, if, if you'll go over to chapter 9 of Genesis, I'm sorry, go to, go to uh, um, chapter 6 and verse 8 first. We're on the way anyway. It gets so bad, when you look at chapter 6, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of jump down, it starts talking about... Uh, what is happening with people. And in verse 5 it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now think about that. That every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Sometimes we think about and we hear each other talk about or we hear other people talk about how bad it is nowadays, right? How bad it's gotten. Think about how bad it would be if for all of mankind that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. It says, The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men, animals, creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air, but I am for I'm grieved that I have them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So we're going to get to start again. And so the flood comes, and Noah and his family, we have, we have eight souls, I mean, as it puts it in the New Testament, eight souls 
who are saved from an evil world. You think, okay, they were saved from the flood. No, it, it actually says that, Peter says it this way, uh, being inspired by God, they were saved from an evil world, what they were saved from. And water was the means of that happening. And it's, it's a very interesting analogy. But as you look at this, if you, if you just go over a little further, the flood came, wiped everything else out. God had had Noah do the work of preserving his creation as far as life was concerned. And if you go over to chapter 9 now, uh, beginning in verse 18, it says, The sons of Noah came out of the ark with Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. So you need a new start. Everything's great. Everything's going great. We're going to start all over. But get ready because here we go again. Noah, a man of soul, proceeded to the vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Apheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and found what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan. The lowest of slaves will, be, will he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God stay in the territory of Japheth. And may Japheth live in the tent of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years altogether. Noah lived 950 years, and then he died. Well, here we go again. Already. I mean, how long is this going to go on? Turn over to Judges. We're kind of bouncing. We're not, we're not looking at every instance, of course. But, but Judges kind of puts it... Uh, in a nutshell, you might say, uh, as to what people of Israel were doing, uh, those that God had chosen, and the reason he had chosen, chosen them was because of Abram, who was, was then called by God Abraham, because he had faith. And God considered him righteous because he had faith in God. It wasn't that Abraham was a perfect man in and of his own right, but God reckoned it to him as righteousness because he believed God. And with that, and there's there's a lot of passages you can turn to and, and read of that. I'm not going to mention them all right now, but um, James chapter 2, if you want to write any of those down, uh, Romans chapter 4 and chapter 5, or some others if you wanted to jot those down, to look at uh, actually description of what happens with Abraham in Genesis. But in Judges, in chapter 2, I want us to look together, um, and we're going to bounce verses just a little bit. In chapter 2, in verse 11... It says, then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This is after Joshua's day. It's after Joshua has now, I mean, he's helped in, in getting the people into the land of Canaan. And, and he has lived his life and he has died. And actually, verse 10 says this. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done to Israel. Then, verse 11, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. The Baals were the foreign gods. They were, they were ones that, and in specific, I mean, there was one that was, was called Baal. And, and this simply foreign god, not a real god at all, but an idol that they would worship. And we see the same kind of thing today. But I want to jump on down just a little bit because it starts talking about how God helps deliver his people. It says in verse 16, yeah, let's, let's just start in verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who, who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. They had God allowed people to come in and start plundering them. You know, they'd gone into the land of Canaan. Uh, they, they were supposed to call the people out. They failed in doing all of that. And God allowed people to come in even from outside of that and, and to over to them. But it says the Lord raises up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worship them. Unlike their fathers, they quickly turned from the way in which their fathers had walked and the way of obedience to the Lord's command. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of 
of their enemy as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. When the judge died, the people returned to the way even more corrupt than those of their fathers, following other gods and serving and whipping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And if you read, if you just kept reading from there and read through Judges, you would see happening exactly what he just described. God would deliver the people, and they would rejoice because they, they were delivered. And as long as that judge lived, and in each case, it's going to tell you this judge lived this many years and judged over Israel, and everything was good. As soon as that judge died, here we go again. Thing of a new year. To some degree, here we go again. I mean, there's 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 the celebrations that come. There's the the longing for new year to happen, and and looking forward. And and you know when there's when there's social media. And you can look at social media, and you can see that people are really looking forward to a new year. Because, And in a lot of cases, it's because they really didn't like the last year that much. I mean, honestly, right? You know, it, it, because bad things happen to us, right? Now, that's, that's a whole other sermon in itself. Why do bad things happen to good people? But when we... When we look at this, we, we see the, that people, and we become a part of that as well. We just we long for this, this new year to come because we know this year this year is going to be better. And so we can easily get wrapped up in that, and yet the first couple of days take place. And I will... I'm trying to remember what morning it was. I left the house. I think it was Thursday morning. And just went over the hill, and there was a wreck. I mean, two cars, it looked like they were playing chicken <laughs> because they were both hit there on the driver's side, you know, in the front fender, and one would turn completely sideways. And I thought, boy, that's pretty bad. They were already, I mean, there was people helping, and, and they, there was a, a already there, went on up the hill, crossed the railroad tracks, and there was another one. I mean, it had been right there, and still one of the vehicles there. I mean, I hadn't, I was a mile and a half at the most from home in the country, so that's not very far, and, and there's two wrecks. Coming on in to Springfield, there on the highway, there's another wreck. So I'm calling home, telling Redonna, Remy, to be careful, it's it's wreck day, you know, it's, it's but but you think... You think of of those people so early on in the year, and I mean, it's already started. They've got to be thinking, here we go again. After the celebrations, after the excitement, do you feel it? Or is it just another day? It was another day, set your foot on the ground out of the bed to get dressed exactly the same way you did in 2019. Go to work or go to school, or, and I know some of you aren't back in school yet, but you're getting ready to. And here we go again. How about us and what's happening in here? You know, we talked about resolutions last week, and we we looked at that a little bit, and and how that how that we can make a resolution that is solid for life, not just for a year. In Ecclesiastes chapter one, and Ecclesiastes, it's it's one of those really interesting situations where you have somebody writing and and know that God was using Solomon as a teacher, as a preacher, even as as he says in the Song of Solomon, calling himself. But but 
in Ecclesiastes, you really see the struggle that he went through of life. And you see some statements that are made that, that aren't intended to be, okay, this is, this is truth and this is, this is the way it is, such as like man's the same as dog, he just dies. But Solomon is coming from a standpoint, and he even, he even describes this. As you start, start reading Ecclesiastes, and you start seeing some of the things that he says of this struggle of this is all worthless. Living this life, I'm doing this, and it's all been done before, and it's all going to be done again. And it's vanity. It's useless. There's no, no need for this. And he even says, I'm looking at this from the standpoint, I'm wiser than anybody else that has lived. And he was. But listen to, that, to, to the word here, starting in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear fill of hearing. What has been will be in. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. And even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. It kind of gets you down. <laughs> you know, I think I think it was meant to. Because he's he's writing and exceptional writing that brings you to the level of where he was at. There's what is the point? Because here we go again. And that's where Solomon was at. You know, he ends this whole thing up. He says a lot in Ecclesiastes. Just fascinating, small book to read. But he says of the whole duty of man, he gets to the end of this, is to fear God and keep his commandments. So recognize why we are here. This idea of, of nothing new under the sun. He doesn't leave it in chapter 1. I mean, he discusses that elsewhere. Maybe, maybe the reason he brought that out, maybe the reason that God had him bring that out, because we long for something new, don't we? Anybody get anything new for Christmas? See a few hands going up. Got something new for Christmas. Is it a new year? Yeah, as as we date things, and and incredibly still still by the birth of Jesus and affecting the world. But when we look from a perspective of, of Solomon, you know, there's nothing new. I mean, whatever whatever we're going to be able to experience, because, you know, you there's there's all kinds of gadgets that we call new now, right? I mean, that, that haven't existed before. But, I mean, in no time, in no time, they're just another gadget. How many of you were excited when blackberries came out? Not 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 the little berries, but the, the devices. <laughs> you know, really excited. How many still have a blackberry and use it? Do what? A few months ago, one of the old ones. <laughs> Renee's got one. <laughs> Renee's not new. <laughs> But the, the excitement of these new things wear off because 
there's really nothing new. There's 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 distractions. There are there are things that we can use for a little while, and and then all of a sudden they're they're not the answer either. And we look for answers in the wrong places. We go the wrong directions looking for the answers sometimes to fulfill what God can fulfill. But do you want something new? I mean, be honest. Do you want something new? We do. Well, if you will, turn, and you don't even have to turn. Somebody knows the song. Um, but Lamentation chapter 3, verses 22 through 24 um, Something similar to the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in Him. They are new every morning. His mercies. So when when that same foot out of the same bed hits the same floor tomorrow morning... His mercies are new for you. Because you need them today as much as you needed them the day before. You want something new. It's, it's not in this physical creation. It's not in everything Solomon could experience because he had more than anybody else had and had ever had. And he understood more about it than anybody else had ever understood about it. He writes about it and he says, even that, even that was folly. Because he realized he was no better off than the fool. What good did it do him to know so much more than everybody else? It's interesting how he goes through all of that. We can have something that wasn't yet given. He was a prophet. He was a king. He was a preacher. He was a teacher. He was a prophet. And the way the Hebrew writer puts it in Hebrews chapter 11 is they didn't receive the promises, even the promises that they spoke about. Not until Jesus came. And so we have something new. But not only have something, but if you will, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. If you guys want to make your way up, you can. He says this. In verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a world point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We know that Jesus isn't here on the earth now. He says, though we once pictured him from a worldly point of view, we saw him in the flesh. We experienced him here. Now that's different. But he says, from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. A new creation. That is you. With his mercies being new every morning, I mean, what is mercy but the not giving of what is deserved? It is your forgiveness. Because you're walking in Christ, the blood of Jesus, his son, is cleansing your hearts from all sin. John chapter 1 and verse 7. You want to see something new? Look at the person next to you new creature nobody's looking <laughs> a new creation that's what God is making you every day it's up to us, us how we use it so Solomon now there is something new there's you if you don't have that you don't have Christ, because it, in the context of what we're reading there in Second Corinthians, it is in Christ. If He hasn't yet reconciled.
reconciled you to the Father. If, he, if you have not been forgiven of your sins, you can have that. And it's one that's lasting. It doesn't get old because it's new every morning. We can't create a gadget that is. If you need to respond to that message, then that's a good, here we go again. Come as we stand and sing.